Part of the Edmonton Oilers offseason roster overhaul was integrating forward Victor Arvidsson. Entering his 11th NHL season and coming off of an injury plague campaign in L.A., what can the Oilers realistically expect? You are Locked On Oilers, your daily podcast on the Edmonton Oilers. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this Tuesday edition of Locked On Oilers. I am your host, Nick Sararis. I want to thank everybody who's making Locked On Oilers their first listen of the day. Locked On Oilers, a part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And today's episode is brought to you by our friends over at FanDuel, where now through September 22nd, all FanDuel customers can bet $5 and get a three-week free trial of NFL Sunday Ticket from YouTube and YouTube TV. Visit FanDuel.com to get started. So. Today's episode is going to be in a very similar vein to yesterday's Jeff Skinner episode, which if you did not get a chance to check it out, was a deep look at Skinner's season in Buffalo last year, what the Oilers can realistically expect, the type of player he is, what his statistical profile at this point in his career profiles him as. And today's episode, it's going to be in the same vein. We're going to take a deep, long look at Victor Arvidsson who, according to reports I was reading before I started recording today's episode, was skating on a line with Dreisaitl and Jeff Skinner at at a organized skate that wasn't officially a practice on Tuesday morning. So if that's the first look the Oilers are going to go with, you would assume Ryan Nugent Hopkins is going to slide in with McDavid and Zach Hyman. And then if you're going to run Skinner with Dreisaitl and Arvidsson, then you go down to Henrique, you got Connor Brown in there somewhere, you got Yanmark, you got Perry, you got Derek Ryan, you got a lot of different ways. You got Matthew Savoie, you got a lot of different ways you can go through that bottom six and organize this team. But at the outset, and we've talked about this a lot this summer, I talked about this quite a bit when we were doing the salary cap stuff last week. We were talking about where the Oilers go from here as far as maintaining a window of contention. That was the main point of Friday's show is what the next two, three seasons look like. The Oilers are going to need to take chances on players. Whatever the red flag or the reason teams are staying away from somebody, the Oilers have shown an appetite to take on risk, and they have shown that they feel, because of the way their roster is constructed, because of the fact they have superstar talent, they can manufacture more offense. They can make more in the aggregate. And somebody like Victor Arvidsson, coming off of a serious injury, you know, anytime you're a professional athlete and we're talking about back surgery, it is not as routine as some of the other procedures we see players undergo. It, it sounds fundamental, but as anybody who's over the age of 24, 25 can tell you, you sleep the wrong way at night, you're going to wake up and your back's going to bother you all day. And that's just sitting at a desk, sending emails, typing out memos and talking to other people walking around the office. That's not training. That's not playing in the game. That's not absorbing hits. That's not dealing with contact. And when you are coming off of a major surgery where you got to think about it, you know, your back, it, it's big. And I know this is uh, about a middle school interpretation of biology when we're talking about the kinesiology and the movement as the movement of the human body. But when your back is dinged up, it is going to impact the way you move entirely and the way that your arms are going to move the way your legs are going to move everything obviously is interconnected but a back injury is nothing to take lightly and the fact that Arvidsson at 30 something years old came off of a major back injury played in 18 regular season games for the Kings last season and had 15 points in those 18 games that's a really strong indicator of a player who still got something left in the tank and we, on today's episode, are mostly going to be look at, looking at Arvidsson's stats from two seasons ago, 2022-2023, because 18 regular season games is not enough of a sample to accurately evaluate a player. When we want to evaluate a player, we want to have as many games, as many seasons, as much as we possibly can to really iron out what an average season looks like because that's how you should evaluate a player. You want to look at what their averages are over the course of an entire career. That way, you're not getting your hopes up for a rebound off of a down year, or you're getting your hopes up of, oh, this guy is this, when in reality, he's probably a little bit closer to this. You know, 
We talked about this earlier in the summer with Zach Hyman. Coming off of a 54-goal season, you probably are going to bank on him hitting 30 this upcoming season, which, you know, only 20, 30 players in the entire league hit that 30-goal plateau. But if you are expecting 50 goals from Zach Hyman this year, you're going to be disappointed. All right. So going to our actual subject of the episode, always good when we can do a four-minute introduction and delay getting to the actual subject at hand. So Victor Arvidsson, fourth-round pick 10 years ago in 2014 of the Nashville Predators. He gets traded to the LA Kings for a second and a third round pick in the summer of 2021. He spends the last three seasons in LA and mostly plays with the Oilers, excuse me, the Oilers, mostly plays with the Kings' best defensive trio. So in his last full season, so 2022-2023, he averages 17.06 of time on ice per game. He is the Oilers. I keep saying the Oilers because I'm I'm thinking about it. He is the Kings' third most used forward on that team behind Anze Kopitar and Adrian Kempe, two very good players. His most common line mates two years ago, Philip Deneau and Trevor Moore. That is one of the pre- – that was, I should say, because it was two years ago. That was one of the premier defensive forward lines in the entire NHL. Deneau is arguably the best second-line defensive center in the entire league. He might just be the best defensive center in the entire league. The counting stats are never going to be there for him, but he's solid. Trevor Moore, very good player. And then Alex Iafalo and Kevin Fiala, two very solid players. Fiala, of course, 35, 40 goal upside, really quality player. And then the most common defenseman deployed with two years ago, the Kings first pair, Drew Doughty and Mikey Anderson. And that speaks to the idea that when they had Arvidsson out there with Deneau and with Trevor Moore and with Drew Doughty and with Mikey Anderson, that quintuplet quad I, I forget what the word is for five oct no oct is eight quin so pent yeah that pen tuple gun i don't know that five person unit was really assigned difficult defensive responsibilities they were put out there against the other team's best players 36.3 of 36.3 percent of arvidson's ice time was against NHL's elite talent, according to Puck IQ, which tracks other teams' quality of talent. And then you got the other component to that is this was a team acquiring Arvidsson with a vision. This, the Kings, when they added Arvidsson, they were a team that was trying to push chips in to become a playoff team. They spent on Philip Deneau, as you'll recall. The Canadians go to that Stanley Cup final where they lose to the Lightning. Philip Deneau gets a big contract from the Kings coming off of that season. And the Kings push some chips in. They go out and get him. They trade a first round pick for Kevin Fiala. They go out and try and improve that roster dramatically because the Kings feel like they are ready to push some chips in. You know, they have two or three lean years there where they're not very good, but they're not atrocious. You trade Jonathan Quick, Drew Doughty starts trying again. And very quickly, you have the makings of a solid. I wouldn't say middle of the road. I would say above average NHL team. You put that group, you have to know you got Kopitar. That's a really good one, too. You got Kempe. You trade for Fiala. You trade for Arvidsson. You got Trevor Moore. You draft Quentin Byfeld. Then you trade for Pierre-Luc Dubois this past year. That doesn't work out. But everything about Arvidsson's usage, everything about Arvidsson's profile, which we're going to get to in the next two segments where we talk about his chance creation, his forechecking, his zone entries, all of that indicates a responsible player who can contribute to generating offense and has an above average NHL shot. It's simply a matter of how much he has left in the tank. And that's really the roll of the dice the Oilers are playing with here, that they feel that coming off of an injury season where he only played 15 games, He's going to have a lot left in the tank. They got him for two seasons, and we're going to talk all about that coming up next on this edition of Locked on Oilers. So be sure to stick around where we've got your team covered every day. You've heard us talk a lot about FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook. Well, we have something a little different for you. Now, through September 22nd, all FanDuel customers can bet $5 and get a three-week free trial of NFL Sunday Ticket from YouTube and YouTube TV. Then, with a YouTube TV base plan, you'll be able to watch every regular season Sunday afternoon at a market game. All you need is a Google account and a current form of, pay- form of payment, and you can cancel anytime. If you're like me and you are chomping at the bit for more football, 
Bills Dolphins Thursday night. The Bills going to Miami. The Bills are one and a half point road underdogs. After the performance Josh Allen had week one coming back against the Cardinals, I am very intrigued by that number. Other good games in week two. The Lions are seven point home favorites to the Buccaneers. A whole touchdown for a Buccaneers team that dropped 30 something on Washington. That's enticing. The Chargers, six and a half point road favorites against Bryce Young and the Carolina Panthers. The Colts and Packers, the Colts, three and a half point road favorites going to Lambeau against Malik Willis, starting for the injured Jordan Love. So if you want to get in on the action, get in on the football fun. Visit FanDuel.com and download America's number one sports book. Thank you for making Locked On NHL your first listen of the day. For your second listen, enjoy the Locked On NHL podcast. Locked On NHL provides you with a national perspective on all things NHL each and every day with national experts and local insights on every team in the league. Available on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. So a lot of my talk this offseason about Skinner, about Arvidsson, has been centered on the principle of understand their roles and specialization being the key. here. When you are this close, like the Oilers were, you know, we're talking about two goals being the difference between winning the Stanley Cup and losing in seven. You are tinkering on the margin. You are trying to find individuals who excel at specific things, dropping them into your lineup and seeing if they can translate those specific skills they were able to exhibit in other places to what Edmonton needs from them. And Arvidsson has a more well-rounded statistical profile than what Jeff Skinner brings to the table. You heard me talk a lot yesterday and throughout the summer, the idea that Skinner is a one-dimensional player. He's very good at what he's good at, but other than that, he is a liability. Arvidsson is a bit more well-rounded. He's able to contribute to multiple facets of the game. And look, he's not a defensive stalwart. He's not taking chances away, but he is he is a quality driver of offense and has a long standing statistical profile to support the idea that he can help create offense and create quality offense as well. So when we look at those numbers from two years ago, when Arvidsson was on the ice, the Kings generated 1,090 scoring chances for They conceded 976. That's almost 100 more. That's more than 100 more, excuse me. The Kings had 41 goals for, 39 goals against. 49.15 expected goals for, 42.6 expected goals against. So with those expected goal numbers being a bit different than the actual result, that tells us something, but we'll get there in a second. 207 high danger chances for, 184 high danger chances against. 6.91 on ice shooting percentage. So that's Arvidsson and the four line mates that are out there with him at five on five combined for 6.9 on ice shooting. And then a 9202 on ice save, so a 920 save percentage. Third highest rate of shots per 60 minutes on the Kings two years ago on 7% shooting. And this is the key to understanding a player like Arvidsson. Although he himself, as an individual, has an abo- a career above average shooting percentage for his career in full seasons he's played. He's an 11% shooter, which is above average. Our NHL average in today's league is about 9.5% to 10%. It depends on the given season. It's somewhere in that mark. But to be over 1% higher than league average for shooting, you're an above average shooter. You've got a little bit of oomph to your game. But you need to remember one thing, what we talked about in the first segment. Who Arvidsson was playing with, what that line's responsibility was, and what they would typically do. So. This is something you heard me talk about a lot in the playoffs. The idea that the Oilers need forwards who aren't just creating offense to try and score, that they are creating offense for time of possession to put pressure on the defense and take pressure off of Edmonton's own defense. And Arvidsson has shown the ability to help maintain a cycle. Arvidsson's game translates really well to interplay in the offensive zone We're going to talk about his transition stats in the third and final segment as we look into what we can realistically expect from him. But think about it in terms of assignment and responsibility. If Arvidsson is able to generate more chances, more expected goals, and more high danger chances than the opponent, that tells you a few things. Number one, it tells you his line has the puck a lot. And 
it supports the idea that him, Deneau, and Trevor Moore, their responsibility was to play offensive zone hockey that was predicated on time of possession. And Philip Deneau and Trevor Moore, they don't have the offensive elements to their game that Arvidsson does. They are not as good of shooters. That's why that on-ice shooting percentage, which includes those, which includes the defensemen, that number is a little bit lower than what um, Arvidsson himself has done for his career and what Arvidsson himself did that season. That tells me that line's responsibility primarily was to keep the puck away from opponents. And we talked about this a lot in the postseason in regards to Dreisaitl's line, especially when Evander Kane was there earlier in the postseason, that they were getting hung out to dry in their own zone, that they were not getting from defense to offense quickly enough in their own zone. Other teams were able to cycle, force them to play defense, wear them down, and eventually score some goals. You know, at one point in that series against the Canucks, the Canucks were outscoring Dreisaitl's line 5-2, to two. At five on five, it was five to two or four to two. I'd have to go back and check to be sure. But it was four to two or five to two, I want to say, through four games. And if you have Arvidsson in there and you have Jeff Skinner in there alongside Dreisaitl, that tells me you are looking for more to your game. You don't want to just live off of the rush. And in an ideal world, and this is me just talking out uh, hypothetically, I love the idea and they would need another forward to be able to do this, but I love the idea of playing Adam Henry with Victor Arvidsson. If you can get one more forward in that mix, if Matthew Savoie can hit the ground running, and you can run Henrik Arvidsson, and then in an ideal world, you get Nuge there, and you're talking about a premier defensive second line that can really put it to the other team not just in preventing the other team from going from defense to offense, but maintaining offensive zone time, wearing away at the defense, wearing away at the goaltender, and really helping tilt the ice. You know, that's something the Oilers do need more of this season. They need more offensive zone time that is rooted in chance creation and putting pressure on the defense. You know, the idea that you want to do this to set something else up. You think about it, in terms of football, you know, you want to hit those intermediate underneath things to start opening up the run game in today's game. Back in the day, it was we want to hit the run a couple times and then we want to hit play action because the defense is anticipating run. But now we are at a point where hockey is kind of evolving. We're getting to that next. What does the game look like? And a lot of it is simple. We're going up and down. We're trading chances. But the teams that are able to maintain offensive zone time for prolonged period. You look at what the Panthers were able to do all the way to a Stanley Cup. You look at the Hurricanes over the last five years where Rod Brindamore is the head coach. You look at what the Stars do. You look at what the Flames and the Kings did under Daryl Sutter. Those types of principles are very sticky year over year. That If you have enough offensive zone time, you create enough chances, you create enough quality scoring chances, you do that enough over the course of a game, a week, a month, a season, you are going to win more games than you lose. And the Oilers are going to win more games than they lose no matter what. But if you can incorporate this element, this style of hockey, to what they already do well, then we're talking about a multifaceted offensive attack that really has some teeth to it. And that was their ultimate undoing against the Panthers, was needing to create off of the rush. If that first rush chance doesn't result in a quality look, it's going back the other way and Florida's going to bang you down low. They're going to get you in your own zone for 45 seconds to a minute to a minute and a half. And really quickly, you are going to be burnt out. Coming up next on Locked On Oilers, we are going to tackle his transition. We're going to tackle Victor Arvidsson's transition looks and what you can realistically expect, how I would ideally deploy him and a whole lot more on this edition of Locked On Oilers, where we've got your team covered every day. Thank you to everyone who is hanging out on this Tuesday edition of Locked On Oilers, where we've got your team covered every day. And man, this is the type of gamble you want to see your team take. Arvidsson has a 10-year profile of strong possession metrics, good transition numbers, and he's never really played with anybody this good. You know, he got looks with Philip Forsberg in Nashville. He played with Roman Yossi. In L.A., getting to play with Drew Doughty, some with Deneau, some with Kevin Fiala. None of those guys are as good as Leon Dreisaitl and Connor McDavid. 
And I said it yesterday in regards to Skinner. I'll say it again now in regards to Arvidsson. There will be a lot of variation throughout this lineup. I think it's going to take a little while to find the right mix of forwards to go with what center. I think the Oilers are going to find... Per- the Oilers have enough talent that they will find multiple configurations of a top nine that work for them because they are that good. But I would not be surprised if it takes until December to really hard solidify, okay, McDavid is running with Hyman and blank. Dreisaitl is running with blank and blank. And then once we go from there, we can start to iron out that bottom six. We're going to figure out if Savoie is a candidate to really play or not. And that is an exciting, exciting place to be because it means the Oilers have options. And you heard me talk about it at the end of the last segment, this idea that the Oilers need multiple ways of attack. They need multiple ways to put pressure on the other team. And the more combinations you have that are viable, that work, the more possibilities you have to create offense. And in today's NHL, the more diversity you have in your offensive attack, the more dangerous a hockey team you are. And with the defense and with the goaltending, the way it's looking, for the Oilers going into this upcoming season where it's a little bit uncertain, where there's going to be volatility, having as much offensive zone time, mitigating defensive responsibility as much as you can, it's of the utmost importance. So when we're talking about Arvidsson's underlyings and his transition stats, the thing that jumps out to me is highest ratio of carry-ins to carry percentage on the Kings two years ago. So what does that mean? So carry-ins are exactly what they sound like. Arvidsson has the puck on his stick going through the neutral zone. He carries the puck into the offensive zone without dumping it and without passing it. He is really good at getting through the neutral zone and carrying the puck in. And then just overalls, that means not only is he good at carrying the puck into the offensive zone, he carries the puck into the offensive zone at the highest rate of anybody on that Kings team two years ago. Now, you do that in conjunction with Jeff Skinner, who is very good at carrying the puck through the neutral zone, even though he doesn't do it nearly as often as Arvidsson does, with Dreisaitl, who is also very good at carrying the puck into the offensive zone, you have multiple means of attack just to gain the offensive zone. So that's a way you can put more pressure on the defense. If we're varying who's carrying the puck into the offensive zone, well, that means who's open to receive a pass in the offensive zone is going to be different. If Arvidsson's carrying it in on the right side, that's going to free up Dreisaitl to occupy a different space. If Dreisaitl's carrying it in, that's going to give Skinner and Arvidsson different places to occupy. If Skinner carries it in, different spots for Arvidsson and Dreisaitl to occupy. So not only is this about just getting a good hockey player, it is the specific skill set that Arvidsson possesses that makes this a worthwhile proposition, a worthwhile gamble. His underlyings are strong. When you have an above average rate of scoring chances and chance creation, an above average number of scoring chance assists, an above average rate of high danger shots and assists that lead to high danger shots. And this is all while playing most of your shifts with two guys who are not offensively inclined into Noah and Trevor Moore. Really quickly, you can see what the plan is here. If you have two lines that are just outright dominant in possession, Then the responsibilities on your third and fourth line and your defense, they are lesser. You giving Dreisaitl two, if not three, if not four, depending on what you do with Hyman and Nuge, if you got four viable candidates to play with both Dreisaitl and McDavid, you are giving these guys more opportunities, more options. The more options you have, the more information you have, the better prepared you are for whatever comes your way. In a given game, there are so many little variables that go into producing the outcome of a game. The more quality players you have who are good at different things, who are able to put pressure on defenses, this is the way you need to live in today's NHL. It can't just be, all right, get the puck to Leon. He'll carry it in. Once he carries it in, Fogel's going to go down low to get it. Evander Kane's going to occupy the net front. That starts to become one-dimensional. Teams start to sit on that cross-seam pass. They start to sit on that jam play at the net front and break it up and force you to look for that secondary look. And you think about, what happened down the stretch those last 10 minutes of Game 7 against Florida, where it was McDavid, Dreisaitl, Hyman, Ekholm, and Bouchard. The in almost five of the last 10 minutes, Florida clogged the net front so the jam play was out. They clogged the outside half walls so they couldn't get the cycle going. That meant 
a lot of Ekholm shots, a lot of Bouchard shots. And while those players have a little bit of goal scoring to their game, you're going to settle for that every time as a defense. Because if the choices are a Bouchard shot from 40 feet away or a Hyman jam play at the net front, you'll let Bouchard take the point shot every single time. Now, with Skinner, with Arvidsson, with Hyman, with McDavid, with Dreisaitl, with Nugent Hopkins, with maybe eventually Evander Kane or another forward they bring in, with Adam Henry, with Connor Brown, with Corey Perry, with Derek Ryan, with Matias Shanmar, you have options. The more options, the more variables you're able to introduce to your offense, to your defense, to your overall systems as a team, the more opportunities you are going to have. Just because you have opportunities does not mean you're going to convert them. We all know this. Just because you get good scoring chances doesn't mean you're necessarily going to convert them. But you put everything together about Arvidsson, especially knowing he looked pretty good down the stretch in the regular season, in the 18 regular season games he played, and then the playoffs against the Oilers, with not the best of line mates, and you're going to tell him, all right, your job playing with dry sidle, you're going to carry the puck in every now and then. You are going to win puck battles down low. And that might be the one concern I have about running Arverton Skinner dry sidle. None of those three guys is particularly good as a four checker. Arverton's above average, but we all know Jeff Skinner's not winning puck battles. And Leon, we want him in dangerous positions. We don't want him behind the net trying to win 50 50 pucks. We want him on the half wall so he can receive that 50 50 puck and get it to a better position. Or we want him in a position to shoot the puck. So that's my one concern with that trio is puck battles, 50-50s, trying to cycle it a little bit. And Arvidsson's a strong cycler of the puck. That's one of the core tenets of the LA Kings is that they are a cycle. They are a dump and chase. They are an outwork you team. And the Oilers do need a little bit more of that. And Arvidsson does do that. But him being the sole proprietor of dump and chase and cycle hockey on this line does present a little bit of a conundrum. But that will just about do it for today's edition of Locked On Oilers. So if you could be so kind, please subscribe to the show wherever you get your podcasts. If you are listening on Apple or Spotify, please give the show a five-star review. If you are watching over on YouTube, hit the subscribe button, hit the alarm bell so you get a notification whenever new content goes live. Leave me a comment. How many goals, how many assists for Victor Arvidsson this upcoming season? I will talk to you guys tomorrow. But before we get out of here, thank you for making Locked On Oilers your first listen of the day. Now go check out the Locked On NHL podcast where the season never ends and provides national expertise with a local perspective. You can find the link to Locked On NHL in the description so you don't need to search part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'll talk to you guys tomorrow. Until then, let's go Oilers.